like I said earlier, today is Palm Sunday, and I have a Palm Sunday message for you. It's not from the normal Palm Sunday text, but since it's a message on Sunday, on Palm Sunday, it's a Palm Sunday message for you. Amen. Uh, we were singing a, a song earlier called Yahweh, and there's a line in that song that says, you alone deserve the glory. You alone deserve the praise. You alone deserve the honor, God. So we lift you high, Yahweh, Yahweh. And a few months ago, before I even knew I was speaking, the Holy Spirit said, you need to start preparing a message. And I said, okay, God. And um, so he started telling me kind of what to start looking and studying at. And um, I told Pastor Jackie, I said, I know we're in the book of Acts. And she said, well, you don't have to stay in the book of Acts. I said, well, good, because God didn't give me anything for the book of Acts. <laughs> but he did give me a word. And um, if you're taking notes, the title of my message today is Every Knee Will Bow. So I encourage you uh, to, uh, I hope you have on uh, some strong shoes today. Amen. Uh, Pastor Jackie is going to bring a word next Sunday, an Easter word. We're going to be shouting and hallelujah, but we're just going to prepare the way for next week, amen, amen. to prepare our hearts. If you have your Bibles, you can go to the book of Daniel, chapter 3, and uh, we're going to pray, and then we will dive in. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here today, God. We know that there are many people that didn't even draw breath this morning, God. So the very fact that we are able to be here today, God, is a blessing. God, we ask that you fill this place, God, with your glory. God, tune our ears to hear what you have to say to us this morning. God, may you be glorified and lifted high through this word. God, I move out the way. May you say everything. Let me say nothing, God. Prepare our hearts to receive what you have in store for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said, we'll be in, we'll actually be in a couple of passages, but we're going to start in Daniel chapter 3. I read out of the New Living Translation, so they're going to have it probably up there for you. But over the last few weeks, like I said, we've been studying in the book of Acts. And we've been reviewing the Acts of the Apostles and their call to go and grow the early church. The early church was built on testimonies of the early believers. As you read the book of Acts, people encounter God, they go and share, and the church grows. Their testimonies pointed unbelievers in the direction of the only one who could save them, which was Jesus. My question to you this morning is, does your life's testimony point people to the Father, or does it reveal a life that has been riddled with compromise and full of altars to other things and other gods? This morning, we're going to be talking about idolatry. As free people, we choose who we get to bow our knee to. Jesus doesn't make us bow our knee to him, but unfortunately, Many believers who bear the name of Christ choose to willingly bow our knees at other altars, to false altars and gods. This morning we're going to take a deep dive, like I said, into the subject of idolatry. And there are many examples of idolatry in the Bible. If you read the New Testament, it's a common theme amongst the body of Christ. But today we're going to look at two of them. Before we do that, let's define what idolatry is. Idolatry in Judaism and Christianity is the worship of someone and something other than God as though it were God. In fact, the first commandment that the Lord gave us out of the Ten Commandments is, Thou shalt put no other God before me. That was the first commandment. Anything or anyone can become an idol. If we place value for that thing or that person above our value for God. In ancient times, that may have looked like people bowing down to worship a golden statue or worship a calf. In modern times, it may look like us getting our identity from our job, from our relationships, 
or us staring and spending all of our time on devices and filling our lives with things that are unnecessary. We spend more time on our phones than we do in our Bibles and seeking after God. I'm guilty of that. Amen. Okay. I'm just going to tell y'all when I bring the word, I've already been hit before I get up here. Okay. (laughs) I'm not giving you nothing that hasn't hit me already. We're going to take a look at Daniel chapter three. In this chapter, we meet three Hebrew boys. Their name was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were from the tribe of Judah and were brought to Babylon as captives. They were smart, they were good looking, and had jobs to look over all of the affairs of Babylon. So when you start reading in the book of Daniel, you see how they got there. You see they were friends of Daniel. Um, and even know Daniel in the lion's den, you find that later in the, in the book. Um, but early on, you, you hear about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And and these are actually their Babylonian names. They had Hebrew names too. So we're going to look at what happens when the people of God refuse to compromise their belief system and bow down to what is happening within their culture. So verse one, we've got a lot of text, so y'all roll with me, okay? Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and nine feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue he had set up. So these officials came and stood before the statue Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted out, people of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whether they're race, nation, or language, bowed to the ground and worshiped the gold statue that the king Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But then there were some astrologers there. They went to the king, and they decided they were going to snitch, okay? And they said, hey, King Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to paraphrase in the Jasmine Berry version, okay? King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. Now, didn't you tell all of these people? that they have to bow down once they hear the sound of the trumpet. King said, yes, I did. And he said, well, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said they ain't doing it. They're not not going to bow down. They don't pay any attention to you. They don't respect you. They don't want to follow your instructions. They refuse to serve your God and your gods with an S, and do not worship the gold statue that you have set up. So the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar, he gets upset. He's furious. He's like, call him in here. Now, if you read earlier, he had already had an encounter with him, and he knew that they walked with the Lord. So he knew that they, they had a special relationship with the Lord. That's where, you, you know, we get the, uh, the outline of the Daniel fast, and they were a part of the fast with Daniel, and they, you know, they ate all vegetables, and they did all these things, and he knew that they were wise. He knew that they had dedicated dedicate themselves with the Lord. So, so he had a working relationship with them because at this point he'd already elevated them to be in charge over Babylon, right? Because they were some of his wise men. And so he said, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods, to worship the gold statue that I have set up. He said, I'm gonna give y'all, I like y'all, so I'm gonna give y'all another chance, okay? I'm gonna give y'all another chance to worship the statue that I have made when you hear the next sound of the trumpet. But if you refuse, you will be immediately thrown into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? So Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego They replied, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it very clear to you 
that we will never serve your God or worship the gold statue you have set up. We're going to stop there before we get, we get later on in the passage. So they're looking at the fact that their lives are on the line. They know if we don't bow down to this gold statue, that's the end for us. And imagine being in a, a place with thousands of people and you hear the trumpet sound and you're going there knowing, I am about to bow down. But imagine look at every single person around you on their knees and you be the three that's standing there. Imagine knowing like, okay, I, I, I'm going to have to be about what I say I'm about. Okay? And so they get there, and they get another chance, and they get before King Nebuchadnezzar, and he's like, look, I like y'all. Y'all work for me. We have a good working relationship. I really don't want to do this. But I already told these folks that if you don't bow, you're going to hit this fire. And they were like, we're not going to do it. And I was thinking about this, I was, I was reading this passage. How many of us would have valued our life over standing firm on our conviction? We don't face persecution like this in America yet. But I believe it's coming. But there are many of other believers on the other side of the world who have had to make this decision who have said, for Jesus, I will live and I will die. But with our comfortable version of Christianity in America, I wonder how we would respond in the same situation. But they spoke boldly and said, we will not, and we refuse to bow our knee and serve any other God. And so what happens in this passage is then King Nebuchadnezzar, he gets mad. And he says, y'all people who are working that fire over there, crank it up. Crank it as high as you can get it. So he said, I'm sorry. I gave y'all another chance. Y'all want to do it. You're all about to be thrown in this fire. And I, I, every time I read this, I feel bad for the folks who had to throw them in the fire. Because the Bible said the fire was so hot, the people throwing them in the fire got burnt up. They're like, I didn't ask for this. I bowed. And they're the ones who end up dead. <laughs> Sometimes God knows how to eliminate your enemies, amen? <sighs> but it says they were thrown into the fire. So then it said they threw everything in there. They were fully dressed in their pants, their turbans, their robes, other garments, everything. And so he tied them up, put them in the fire. Later on, Nebuchadnezzar hopped up and said, now wait a minute. Come here, y'all. Didn't, didn't we tie these men up? Yeah. How many was it of them? Shadrach, Meshach, but there was three of them. Huh. Why do I see four people up in there? And he doesn't even look like he's human. There was a fourth person in the fire. So he says, he calls them out, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, come out. And they're like, yeah, what's up? <laughs> they stepped out of the fire. And then all the officials, the governors, everybody that were there, they crowded around. And the Bible said that the fire did not touch them. They weren't singed. They didn't have any burns on their body. The Bible says they didn't even smell like smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angels to rescue his servants that trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any other god except their own. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn from limb by limb and their houses will be burned to heaps of rubble. There's no other god who can rescue like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In 
in that moment, their dedication to the Lord was tested. It was tested. Am I, am I going to live what I say I'm all about? Am I going to be about this? I'm looking at this. I know that this is the end of me, but I choose to trust God. And they said, even in the midst of this, I know that my God has the power to deliver us out of this. But even if he doesn't deliver me out of this, he is still worthy of the glory. I still will not bow my knee at any other God that is not the God, the creator, the one who spoke life into my body. They were not going to be swayed or pressured into bowing to a false God. They believed that God would save them. And their lives testified of the goodness of the Lord. After that moment, everybody around them knew, wait a minute, there's something about this God that they serve. Because this other God, all these other gods that we worship and pray to, they're not doing anything. Only, the, only their God could save them like that. But the Hebrew boys already had history with God. They already knew that they served a God that saved. They knew they served a God that delivered. They knew the God that, that they worshiped. And so they were confident in him. And what happens a lot of times as believers is that we sing, we shout, we, we declare, we say all of these things that everybody in the church knows how to say. But deep down in our heart, we truly don't believe the word of God. Because if we did, then our actions would line up with the word. I was telling my mom the other day, we were discussing the situation. I said, I am convinced that this person does not believe in God. Because if they read their Bibles, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. They wouldn't act the way they act. They wouldn't say the things that they say. They wouldn't respond the way that they respond. So our response really shows what we think about the God that we claim. How we live. How we dedicate our life how we maneuver day in and day out. The things that we yoke ourselves up to shows what we truly believe about God. When you get in this word and you really crack it open, and I'm not talking about just read the, the, the scriptures that are always tattooed on people's bodies and that they're you know, on the back of cars and stuff, but when you really get into the word and you start reading about how God deals with his people that don't act right, Half of this is not about unbelievers. It's about people who claim the name of Jesus, claim to believe in God. He spends half of his time trying to get the church folks right. And that's why here in America, we cry out for God. We cry out. We pray. We believe. We're like, you know, we sing songs. We're going to see revival in these days. And God's like, yeah, not until my people get right. Because why am I going to invite the sinners into a house full of sinners. Because when we invite people into this house, we are supposed to be like Paul and the early disciples and say, follow me as I follow after Christ. But how many of us can say that to somebody? When you start saying, okay, I have people, I have disciples, I have people that are following after me, that makes you live your life right. It makes you watch it. And so I believe that right now in this season that we're in, Pastor Jackie has already delivered a word, a strong word to our church about getting our house in order, about, look, this is not the time in the season to be playing with the Lord, how God, there has been a call that's going forth, not even just from this pulpit, but all over God is speaking to his people saying, you know what, enough is enough. I have given my people enough time to get it right. How many of you have children? Raise your hand if you have children. Okay. You know, uh, my parents was, you know, like I said, I'm staring at 40. So my parents were not in the whole gentle parenting uh, wave and move. Okay. A lot of the stuff we didn't do, not because we didn't want to, is because we didn't want to get a beat down. Okay. So we didn't even try it. You know, when, you know my, my mom tells me all the time, if you just get your bluff in early, they're not even going to try to cross the line. You just, you just got to act crazy early. You, you don't try to act crazy when they're 15. Act crazy when they're like two. And then they can be like, no, my mama, no, my mama, dad, they don't play. 
right? My mom and dad don't play. And, you know, so I believe that God is saying, you know what? Like, look, I'm trying to discipline my house. I'm trying to get some things in order. So then, when I move, because my Bible says before Jesus comes, there's going to be a great move of God. My people are in position. My people know what to do. They're prepared. But when the house of God is out of order, when the people of God are doing any kind of thing, looking like the world, acting like the world, talking like the world, you can't tell the difference between a believer and a non-believer. God can't move the way that he wants to move. And so he's been speaking to us and saying, let's get it together. So look, let's flip our Bibles over to the book of Jeremiah. You know, many of us know Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, he declares a hope and a future. But you need to crack that Bible open to Jeremiah chapter 1. In Jeremiah chapter 2, it's a completely different story. I, after I got done reading Jeremiah, I said, I know why Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. Because God had called him up, and he was young. God had called him up and saying, look, I'm, I'm going to use you to speak to my people. But what I don't want you to do is don't get discouraged when you're talking to them because you're going to say some things to them and I need you to get this message across, but they're still not going to receive it. They're still not going to act right, but I need this word to come to my people. So imagine being a a minister and declaring the word of God and nothing changing. And so we find him in chapter two. We're going to, like I said, we're going to compare and contrast these um, two instances of idolatry. We got a lot. We're going to go through verse 1 through 37. Jeremiah says, the Lord gave me another message. He said, go and shout this message to Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember how eager you were to please me as a young bride long ago, how you loved me and followed me even through the barren wilderness. In those days, Israel was holy to the Lord, the first of his children. All who harmed his people were declared guilty, and disaster fell on them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Listen to the word of the Lord, people of Jacob, all you families of Israel. This is what the Lord said. What did your ancestors find wrong with me that led them, so, led them to stray so far from me? They worshipped worthless idols, only to become worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us safely out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, a land of deserts and pits and a land of drought and death where no one lives and even travels? And when I brought you into a fruitful land to enjoy its bounty and goodness, you defiled my land and corrupted the possession I had promised you. Let's park right there. So we know in the book of Exodus God brought the, the children of Israel out of Egypt, right? So as you begin to read all the different things that happened after they left, you see that they struggled with idolatry. And that idolatry didn't start as soon as they hit the wilderness. The idolatry started back in Egypt, right? So idolatry is the worship of pagan gods, and that's the, that was the worship of the Egyptians. And so they brought this experience that they had into this uh, season of deliverance that God was bringing them. So you would think, you know, that's in their past, right? So you're thinking, that's in my past. As I have an encounter with God, I'm going to leave that there. But that's not what they did. They encountered God. They saw God crack open the water. They saw God provide for them through the wilderness. They saw God provide them food out of nothing. They saw God do all of these miraculous works. And they saw God, first of all, delivered them out of years of captivity. That's enough to be like, you know what? I'm going to follow after this God because he knows what he's doing, right? He knows what he's doing. He's about what he says he's about. He sends all of these plagues. All these different things happen. You know, the death angel comes. All these different things happen just so God's people can be free. And they end up in the wilderness and they forget about the deliverance that they just had. And sometimes that's how we act as believers. We, we come to the altar. 
we pray, we thank God for all the things that he has done for us. And we're so excited. But then when the rubber meets the road, the easy thing is to go back to the thing that we already know. So the easy thing for them was to go back to the gods that they already knew, not the God that they claim that they serve, but the gods that they already worship. So, you know, Moses is up there meeting with God in the clouds, on the mountains, getting the Ten Commandments, and he comes down and he's like, Lord, these people didn't just made a gold cat. They're down here just worshiping all these different, they're having a party and they're just... And he's like, God, what is wrong with your people? So they had this habitual uh, habit of, God, we love you, but God, we want to do our own thing. God, we love you, but we want to worship our own gods. And when you start going into the gods that they were worshiping, these weren't just like, oh, we're just going to worship like these little like cute things. Like they were worshiping like all of these like sexual gods and having sexual orgies and deities and all these different things. They were into some deep stuff, but they claimed to be the children of God. Israel turned away from their first love. They turned away from the one who saved them. And if you read at the end of the Bible, John said, at the end, he says, one thing I have against the church is that you have left your first love. That's what's going to be said about the people of God. You have left your first love. You know, when you first get in a relationship, you're excited. You're like, oh, I can't wait to talk to them and all these different things. You spend all your time. And then when you've been in a relationship for a long time, you're just like, hey, how you doing? You had a good day? Cool. I'm going to my quarter. You go to your quarter, whatever. But you don't spend that time that you were when you were dating or when you were early in your relationship. You're just like, oh, I just can't breathe without this, per-, you know, all of that. And, and, and that's what our relationship with God looks like. When we first get saved, there's nothing like a new believer. Because when you're a new believer, you believe God for everything. You're just like, oh, I'm so excited. I just believe God's going to do miracles, signs, and wonders. I'm going to raise the dead. I'm going to heal the sick. I'm going to do all these things. You're praying. You're fasting. But then you've been walking with the Lord for 10 years, and now you're like, Lord, you Lord, you know my heart. We don't seek God like we used to. We don't pray. I'm talking about myself too, okay? We don't pray like we used to. We don't put a demand or believe God like we used to. We're just like, I'm just okay not going to hell. Like, I'm just cool not going to hell. But everything else, like, I kind of want to do my own thing. And I I talked about this last week in the, um, in the, in the, uh, what was that? Not the benediction, the exhortation of what I like to call Jesus plus theology. A lot of believers like Jesus and whatever they want to do. Not, Jesus, you're the one. Jesus, you're the only. The only thing that I pursue. The only, what, the only place that I run to. The only place that I hide in. They got so caught up in their own idols that they forgot about the God that delivered them. Oh, my page is all mixed up. forgot about the God that delivered them. Hold on, y'all, y'all. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, here we go. Verse 8. The priest did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who taught my word ignored me. The rulers turned against me, and the prophets spoke in the name of Baal, wasting their times on worthless idols. Therefore, I bring my case against you, says the Lord. I will even bring charges against your children's children in the years to come. Go west and look in the land of Cyprus. Go east and search through the land of Kedar. Has anyone ever heard of anything as strange as this? Has any nation ever traded its gods for new ones, even though they are not gods at all? Yet my people have exchanged their glorious gods for worthless idols. He said in that time, even the ministers turned away from God. 
The heathen nations were faithful to their gods, even though they they did nothing to prosper them. But the people of God had been blessed in innumerable ways, but still yet they turned their back on him. How many times has God blessed us? How many times has God opened doors for us? We sing, so many doors you opened, so many ways you made. God, you've been better than good to me. But do we live our lives like he's been better than good to us? It says in verse 12, the heavens are shocked at such a thing and shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord. For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. Fountains of living water um, was representative of an artesian spring. And it was something special. It was a constant supply of good, fresh, life-giving water that came to the people of Israel. Water was a lot of work trying to get it, but a fountain of living water brought it right to you. So what are you saying? Like, look, they have abandoned me, the one who could give them everything. But then they created their own system of getting water and holding water. And it's cracked and it's broken. Having left God, the people worked hard to to do their own thing and build their own kingdom. And here in this world that we live in, you have a lot of people who are even in the church world who say, you know, I want to I want to do my own thing. I want to build my own kingdom. I want to do I want to do this. I want to do that. Not seeking God about it, not praying about it, not following after the will of God. But it's all about selfish ambition and what I want to do, even in the name of God. And that's why I understand more and more now that why Jesus said, look, when I come back, there's going to be some people that say, Lord, Lord, God, I prophesied in your name. Now, wait a minute. Why is my name not on the list? I prophesied. I preached. I laid hands on the sick and they recovered. I even prayed for somebody. They came back from the dead. But I don't see my name on this list, Lord. I think you made a mistake. And he's going to say, depart from me. I don't know you. I don't know you. And that should put the fear of God in us as believers because we can get so used to doing this thing called church that it becomes a part of our routine. Oh, let me, let me open up my Bible. I know I'm supposed to read a little bit. I know I'm supposed to pray over my food, pray over myself a little bit. I'm going to come to church, raise my hands, do this. We just do the same thing every single week. But we're not seeking after God. We're not asking God to transform us. We're not asking God to, to make us more like him. And I was sharing with my Bible study this week that, that what happens in our spiritual life is we, we, we get to a point where we're like doing great things for God and we're loving Jesus and then we just start pouring out. We start doing all these things and we pour it out and then we look up and then our cup is empty. So our spiritual health, our immunity is down, right? Because we're not pouring back into what God has given us. We're not pouring back into our relationship with God. We're just, we're removing, we're doing all these things. We're doing all these things in the name of Jesus, but we're not really seeking after God to fill ourselves back up, right? I'm going to show you how the enemy works. And then the enemy comes in, starts telling lots, oh, you could do that. You okay? Oh yeah, God's going to allow that. You could, oh, yeah, yeah, you can go over there. Oh yeah, yeah, you can be in a relationship with that person. Oh, yeah. You start thinking, huh, maybe I can. You get around some other people, lives kind of compromised too. Y'all sit there like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. And then you look up months later, God, how did I get here? God, I don't know how I ended up so deep in sin. I'm supposed to be the one loving you. I'm supposed to be the one doing all these things. I don't know how I end up here. It's because you had no spiritual immunity. Right? When, during COVID, at the beginning of COVID, my husband, he was already sick, right? Before COVID was a big thing, before everything shut down. He was like one of the first people that had COVID. Not in the world, but first people I knew who had COVID, okay? And um, so the doctor said, because you already had bronchitis, when you contracted COVID, it made it worse for you. And that's why you ended up in such a bad position. I thank God that it wasn't, I um, thank God he's still here. Amen. Because it was pretty bad. But because his immunity was down, he had no defense 
against this virus that was coming. And what happens in our lives as believers, when we're not seeking the Lord, when we're not living right, when we're not filling ourselves back up, when the enemy comes in, we have no defense. And so then we wonder why we end up back in the ditch that God already delivered us out of. And we're like the Israelites going back to the thing that was comfortable. Because the more and more you compromise, the more and more your, 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 your sin nature begins to kick in and say, I want a little bit more of that. You know how when you lie, you got to keep lying to, like, cover yourself? That's how the enemy is. It's just, once he realized that you accepted a lie, he's just going to keep lying. Keep lying. Keep lying. And then you end up in a position where you're like, how did I? I've been walking with the Lord my, for 10 years. How did I end up here? And God's calling us in this season to say, you know what? You need to take your spiritual vitamins. You need to get back in the face of God. You need to build up your spiritual immunity. So when the enemy comes in like a flood, you're like, boop, I don't got time for that. I don't have time for that. Because when the enemy lies and you're in the word and you're seeking after God and you're in the right position, you can recognize that a lie is a lie. You can recognize the deception of the enemy. But when you're out of position, it's easy to be deceived because what the enemy likes to do is he likes to twist the truth to make it look almost like it's the truth. And we're like, well, it's kind of, it sounds kind of like, it kind of sounds right. But if we're not in our word, we don't even know what's the difference between the truth and the lie. And so God is calling us to gird ourselves up as believers. And Paul says, I believe it's in Romans chapter 6, he says, look, as believers, now that you are saved, should you continue on sinning? No. That doesn't mean that you're not going to mess up, but that means that you should not be in a habit of habitual sin. If you call yourself a believer, you can't continue to do the things that God delivered you from. So Paul was teaching the early church who had no, they had no concept of what it looked like to follow after Jesus. He says, you know what? Let me, let me give you a tip. Stop doing it. It's plain and simple. Should you continue to do it? No. Turn away. Because these things are going to corrupt your character. They're going to corrupt your relationship with God. And so you have to flee from sin. And sometimes when you're not strong enough, you have to physically flee from sin. And so that means if you are in a situation and it's getting a little bit too tight, you have to get your behind up and you have to leave out of that situation in order to keep your character intact. Sometimes it's just that simple. Sometimes you say, you know, I need to leave this conversation because I have a habit of gossiping. And I know that if I stay in this conversation, I'm going to do that. Or I have a habit of anger, and I know if I stay in the situation, I'm about to get upset. So let me leave so that I can keep honoring and glorifying God with what's coming out of my mouth, what's, what's, what I'm doing with my body. Paul says, don't let any part of your body cause you to sin. No part of your body cause you to sin. And so what happens is that we fall back on the things that bring us comfort and we run to the alcohol we run to the weed we run to the sex we run to the wrong friends and the wrong relationships because we know that there's instant gratification in that instead of saying you know what let me get down and bow my knee before the father and find the very thing that I need so God is asking us are you willing to sacrifice some things, to sacrifice your desires, your will, your emotions, all of those things in order to be in right standing with me, in order to be in right position with me. I'm not even going to get through all this passage, but uh, y'all can read that in y'all's, y'all devotion. Continue to, continue to read through this because Israel ended up in a state of delusion. They were so deep in sin. Verse 23 says, you say that's not true. I haven't worshipped the the images of Baal, but how can you say that? Go and look in the valley in the land and face the awful sins that you have done. God is asking us in this season to really take a good look and examine ourselves examine ourselves. And, and I've been teaching in my Bible study, examination doesn't just happen the one time you come down to the altar. 
That's a daily thing. Our goal is to look like Jesus. Our goal when people look like look at us is that they see Jesus on the inside of us. So if you look at your life and say, mm, this don't look a little bit like Jesus, then ask the Holy Spirit to show you. He will tell you. That's up to you if you want to obey. But he will tell you, Mm-mm, you're running your mouth too much. Mm-mm. You like to pop off on people. Don't do it. Mm-mm. That person you're talking to, you need to shut it down. Okay? The Holy Spirit ain't never lied. Now, sometimes we act like he's lying or we act like we're deaf and we can't hear what he's trying to tell us. But he will tell you if you seek after him. The Bible says if you seek him, you will find him. So God is trying to get us all in position so that we don't miss out on what he has for us. And so even in this season, I'm asking God, Lord, show me any other altar that I have built that is not yours and tear it down. It doesn't matter how long you've been walking with the Lord. Examination is a part of our biblical routine. You can be 90-something years old and still be out of pocket with the Lord and been in church for 80 years. My grandma says all the time, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to tighten up every screw. She's 99. But she knows that she's facing eternity. So she said, uh-uh. Y'all, y'all ain't about to catch me slipping. I have something else that I could work on. I was reading my Bible. There was something else. So I said, ooh, Lord, let me repent. And sometimes we, we feel like repentance is something that you do when you're like, you know, just terrible and you're sinning and you're doing all this. But repentance is a part of the Christian lifestyle. It's going for the Lord saying, God, I messed up today. God, I was trying to be like you, and I, I failed. God, help me, Holy Spirit. And when you are aware of your weaknesses, when you are aware of the areas where you need help in and growth in, that's when the Holy Spirit can come and start helping you do that. But what happens is a lot of times we like to be blind to what's going on in our own lives. Like God didn't see it. He created us. Like he told Jeremiah, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. I created you. I knew I was going to put you on this earth for this purpose. So he knows you. He knows your proclivities. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. And all he's asking you is to lay that down at his feet. But when you lay it down, don't pick it back up. I believe that God is calling us to a season of holiness. Because Jesus says, either you be hot or cold, but the lukewarm I'm not going to deal with. And when the people of God get in right position with God, we're going to see a move of God in this country like never before. What we have been experiencing here at Light of the World is just scratching the surface of what God wants to do here in our church, here in our city, and here in our nation. But he is looking for people. He told Jeremiah, if I, if I find one person, I hold back. He couldn't find one person. And these were people who had history with God. They've seen God move. They've seen God do things for them. But yet they still decided to choose themselves in their own desires over the will of God. So I hope and I pray that you can join me in asking God, Lord, show me me. Reveal to me, God, the areas of my life that are out of alignment. For any of us to stand up here and act like we don't have anything to work on, it's pride. Because until Jesus cracks the sky, we have something that we can surrender to the Lord. None of us are Jesus. I don't care if you preach for a living. I don't care if you lay hands and prophesy and do all these different things. We all have to bow our knee. And Philippi- I believe it's in Philippians, it says, every knee will bow. And every tongue shall confess 
that Jesus is Lord. Either we are going to bow our knee to the Lord willingly, or when he comes, we're going to bow unwillingly. But we're going to bow our knee to Jesus.